Live from the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities, and I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang, and joining me, as always, is Bernie Ryan, DJ Starwatcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, hi, Sarah. Very good. Thank you. Bernie is our professor of the Astronomy Lab at USM and our local protector of the night skies and also the author of um, Skylights, the official newsletter of the Astronomical Society of Northern New England. So reach out to us at speaking at gmail.com if you've got any questions, comments, or you can also tweet at WMPGSciSpeak um, any of your concerns or uh, anything interesting that you've recently discovered. Bernie, could you let our guests know what to expect up in the night sky for this coming week? Okay, yes, certainly we'll do that. Very interesting week coming up, uh, getting ready for a big Mars opposition in another week or so. We can get ready for that. Okay, so this is Friday the 25th, so we'll have a waxing gibbous moon. Um, it was first quarter a couple of days ago. And it's a waxing gibbous. It'll be a full moon on October 2nd. Actually, we're going to have two full moons in October. So that'll be interesting to look for that. And so basically, you still have Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, they're now getting a little closer together every night. They're about seven degrees apart, and they're getting closer. Those are up well before it gets dark. And then Mars now comes up about 830. So we had some really good views of Mars. Mars will be the star for the entire next month. You should also be aware we have a whole armada of different missions going to Mars. They've all been launched. Uh, we launched one called the Perseverance rover. Then the Chinese have launched one that has an orbiter, a lander, and a rover. And the Euro United Arab Emirates even launched one. So we have six different vehicles going to Mars from three different missions. They're going to get there early next year. So all kinds of things are going on with Mars. So that's really going to be the highlight for next month. So everyone should be. Well, we had, a, we had some viewing at the observatory. We had our star fest. And a few people, obviously far fewer people showed up. So we got some great views of Mars through the telescopes. You can already see dark markings and ice caps. Of course, we looked at Jupiter and Saturn, and we didn't stay till Venus comes up because that's about three in the morning. But just ready, get ready for Mars all of next month. Wait, Brittany, you don't you you don't stay up until three a.m. regularly? Uh, well, we didn't that night. <laughs> I, yes. <laughs> And if Bernie talked way too fast, you can check out the monthly What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald. I think the new one is coming out next week, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm writing it right now. <laughs> so Bernie, would you do us the honor of introducing our guest du jour? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a fairly famous guest on tonight. Uh, his name is David Rode. He's a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning author and author of seven or eight books, David? Oh uh, no, four, four. Oh, four books. <laughs> Someday, <laughs> hopefully, but I, I doubled the fourth your one books. nearly, you know, took took a lot out of me. But I am I'm, yeah. I'm here to talk about it. So, yes, so, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, David, uh, for joining us. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm yeah. grateful to you and Sarah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, I just recently bought uh, your latest book, In Deep. Uh, very interesting because I'm basically I try to follow politics. Um, and it gives you really interesting insights into different aspects of how uh, the different parties actually see the deep state and so on. I really wasn't aware that the Republicans, of course, I knew they have a deep state, thinking we're trying to get rid of Trump and so on. But then um, Democrats also see the deep state in a different way. So if you could talk about a little bit of that, David. Sure. One of the reasons I wrote the book is because it is there's a really widespread belief uh, among, just as you said, among liberals and conservatives that there's a sort of somehow an unelected group of people, um, you know, influencing American policy. There was a, a public opinion poll taken a couple of years ago now that said 70% of Americans uh, believe that a group of generals and unelected officials are secretly manipulating American government policy in Washington. Um, they do talk about it differently. As you said, for conservatives, they, they tend to use the term the administrative state that's a kind of ever-growing federal bureaucracy that uh, conservatives fear is, you know, relentlessly interfering in our personal lives, taking away our personal freedoms and trying to manage uh, everything we do. Uh, liberals uh, talk more about the military-industrial complex. That would be a cabal of generals and big defense contracting firms that push the country into war after war. And as we speak, we're all 
going through the pandemic. And it's an amazing moment, uh, an incredibly sad moment. You know, we just passed uh, this week the death toll of 200,000 people. But to me, it showed this big question of, you know, are there nonpartisan government experts uh, that we can trust to help us if there's a pandemic, that we can trust to help defend the country? And, you know, the level of distrust now in, you know, by average Americans of their own government is extremely high. And I, I think it shows the whole debate about masks. It shows if we, you know, if we can't have faith in these government officials, we're, we're, we've got a lot of problems. Um, we won't be able to agree on how to, how to help each other or how to help society as a whole. Hmm. Right. So do you think uh, that we can have faith in them and if we can ferret out the right stories <laughs> or how does Yeah, that have you found work? those people? Yeah, well, my, my, uh, you know, and then I would say part of the problem is the journal is journalists too. And I think a lot of people don't trust the media anymore. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, we are, you know, a fourth branch of government. I, you know, we operate independently. Um, but, but I think there's, this is this, my book or what I found is sort of a wake up call for everybody in the establishment, scientists, astronomers, you know, that they're not trusted either. And I think I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but I'll, I'll set the plate. I think one of the pro I mean, I think, uh, let me just say it again. I think politicians have behaved poorly. I think the media has behaved poorly. Like we should all look at ourselves as experts and think, what are we doing wrong? Why is it easy for people to convince, you know, uh, Americans that, that we're all, each of our professions is lying to them. So first we got to scrutinize ourselves, but separately, you know, I love the web. It's an extraordinary thing. It's, it's here to stay, you know, but I do think we are facing like the greatest disinformation crisis in U.S. history. Um, there's, it's just a, the web has become a sea of unvetted information. Some of it's super accurate. Some of it is complete, you know, bunk and conspiracy theory. But, but it's one of the challenges. I don't know if Bernie, if I'll say our generation, maybe Sarah's generation is. <laughs> yes. How do you kind of govern or what are the guardrails, you know, for the web and information is power information matters. And so false information, I think, uh, primarily online, but also on cable news is like, you know, uh, increasing, exacerbating our divisions and increasing a lot of the paralysis we see. So there are some government officials we can trust, but we've got a giant problem on our hands. Hmm. Yeah, because I always respected the role of journalism and, you know, in really getting to it. But the way it's being cut down now, it, it's really sad because it is obviously an honorable profession that's supposed to keep people accountable and honest, but it's much tougher for them to do that now, I think. So. Well, it's the biggest problem is that there's been a real business crisis in, in journalism. And, you you know, I, I grew up, we can talk about this more, I, you know, I, I grew up, uh, I went to high school in Freiburg and grew up reading the Portland Press Herald and watching the local TV stations in, in Portland. And all of those, you know, uh, places are struggling financially now. The newspaper business model has, you know, collapsed. They can't sell much print advertising. That was the main source of their revenue. And so on a much bigger scale across the media, there's all this pressure about how to make money and the way to get a lot of traffic is to be partisan or, or you know, be very extreme. So whether it's cable news or on websites, if you're looking for viewers or clicks, uh, the more extreme your content, you know, generally the more traffic you get. I, I think that's easing a bit now. Again, the pandemic information, can, you know, accurate information can, can possibly save your life. Um, so I, I think things are changing, but, um, you know, the, the, the biggest, you know, I think the emergence of nonprofit news organizations is a great idea. It doesn't create those kind of pr pressures on them, but I, um, you know, that's a core problem in journalism has been economic pressures. Hmm. Yeah. I'm just surprised how many people are swayed so easily with some of the more right-wing things happening. I mean, you would think maybe at least 75% of Americans, you know, are basically liberal or would like to see things the way they're supposed to be working, whether we've been taught with morals and ethics and all this. So I'm surprised it's that close that he even has a chance. Well, I think that, um, and I'm gonna be mm -hmm. nonpartisan here. Like I, yeah. I'm, I'm, and I think that's part of my job. I think one of the problems in the media is that everyone's become mm -hmm. a pundit. So there needs to be reporters and I, I'll cite him, everybody cites him. I, I would say a good example of a nonpartisan 
a government expert would be like Dr. Tony Fauci. He's been wrong about some things regarding the pandemic, but you know, he is an infectious disease expert, a disease expert with, you know, decades of experience. He could have made a lot more money in the private sector. And I think having people to do that, you know, um, people who teach, obviously, uh, journalists who do that, scientists who do that. Uh, uh, my brother was a police officer, a, you know, good police officer is not engaged in abuses. Um, we need these people as public servants to kind of keep functioning as a, as a society. But you know, there's been all kinds of studies done that, you know, there's conspiracy theories on the left and right. People, we're drawn as a species to kind of tribalism and, you know, the other side is plotting against us. So it, it's very, very, very appealing. Um, and I, you mentioned the president. All I'll say is um, <laughs> I, I'm a mainstream journalist. I, you know, I, the, the Washington Post uh, fact checker has, um, you know, traced his statements, you know, for the last three years. I think it's now the president's approaching 20,000 false or misleading statements. Wow. I, I find that credible. I trust the Washington Post. They have a vetting system. I've worked in big newspapers. And, and so I, I trust them more than the president. But when you have someone who lies so consistently and persuasively, you know, people, you know, it, it will work. And I, so I, 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 I guess I would blame the, bad source of information more than the people who get swayed by it, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. That, that makes sense. Yeah. That, that's a good way to put it. But we, you know, any, and even if you're, you know, looking for a left wing, like, like Trump is a, you know, I don't think there's been any proof that like Donald Trump is a, a secret KGB agent. There's questions about whether Russia has somehow influence over him. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, so that's like a left wing conspiracy that it's not true. But the, again, the difference today is whatever you want to think partisan wise, you can, you know, five, 10 keystrokes, you can find something online that tells you, oh, yeah, it is true. You know, Donald Trump is a secret Russian agent. And so that gets back to this kind of sea of unverified information that, that you know, leads people to believe conspiracy theories that you can access much more quickly than you ever could. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. But then why does he never denounce Putin for any of the things that he's done? Like any other person? Any uh, other I, other? I, people who work closely for the president, uh, like, you know, uh, he, he thinks he has a, he says he has a good relationship with Putin and that he doesn't want to complicate that relationship by criticizing him. And that, that's what he's told aides he, he works with. But I can't, you know, uh, there was another book, you know, this week um, by Andrew Weissman, who was part of the uh, Mueller investigation. And, he, and Weissman admitted that, that part of what they didn't do was look into the president's finances. They decided that was outside their remit. Um, you know, so there's people who suspect that Trump may have gotten money from Russian businessmen, and that's why he has a positive view of, of, uh, of Russia. But to be fair to, the, to Donald Trump, there is no evidence at this point that he is some, you know, secret Russian agent. Robert Mueller, you know, did not find, you know, proof yeah. in terms of a criminal uh, conspiracy in 2016. Mm. And, okay. and I think we have to trust Robert Mueller and, and trust the results of his investigation. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I just wish that wouldn't have been just kind of like almost swept under the rug. And when Bill Barr said, oh, yeah, they, you know, in one paragraph, he summarized the whole thing and he completely exonerated where there was pretty much not at all his real conclusion, but. Uh, yeah, more yeah. Of, more evidence of obstruction of justice that, that that was much clearer evidence. But it's a sort of this era of kind of information warfare and, and mm -hmm. first and, and loudest um, can be, you know, very effective. And, and it's, um, again, I, I think there's a bit of fatigue. I think people are, are kind of learning to be much more, I think Sarah's generation, people are much more skeptical when they read things on the, on the web. So I think that I, I have faith that, that people will, are gonna vet information more and more carefully as, as time goes by. Good, yeah, that's important, especially now with the election so close and people already started voting, I guess, in this one, so. Yes. I, I don't, I wouldn't place too much hope <laughs> in our generation. I mean, I think that there are, you know, there are people who might say like, look, I did my research and all they did was look at, you know, the first three links when they did their like little Google search. 
Um, and it's not always, and social media continues to kind of perpetuate a lot of those, um, I guess, essentialized or generalized ideas or, you know, news about things. So it's- An echo chamber, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I but, think there's, there's also that, that aspect of not really knowing how to investigate to get to the real, um, the source or the truth, because it's not always so transparent, especially when there's so many layers. Well, it's a joy being a journalist because you go and meet with people and talk with them and then they tell you things and then you try to corroborate what they're saying with, you know, two or three other sources and, and you get to kind of, you know, does it rise to the level of, of proof uh, or not? One positive thing, there was a recent survey I can, uh, of people who sort of consume the news. And I think like 70% of them want internet companies to take down uh, false information. Like they feel that that's part of their responsibility. Um, at least 70 or 80% think that, that journalists pay, play a vital role in democracy. But it, again, the, about the same number said that the, they're disappointed in the media because they think it's getting more and more partisan. Um, so I just want to keep emphasizing that, that, you know, to not be discouraged that there, you know, we go through these very tough periods in our history, but, you know, professions and, and industries reform and, and, um, I, I think we can reform and I hope regain some credibility with time. Yeah. Could I ask, um, because now that you mentioned that it reminds me of, um, so I don't know how familiar you are with kind of politics in Taiwan and, and, and China, but um, so they just recently had their election earlier this, uh, this year, and they, are, they often face a barrage of fake news from, from well, I don't know exactly where they're from, but you know, Chinese sources, maybe they're citizens, maybe they're news. Um, and so they kind of have this, uh, this way of identifying, oh, if it's like this, or if it's written like this, or, you know, there are all these little cues in the, in the actual writing that they can then say, oh, this is fake because we don't write like this, or it doesn't use um, the kind of language that we would normally use here. What, um, I guess, it, is there anything in your toolbox that you use to kind of, kind of identify, oh, this needs to be looked into more versus like, yeah, this can be trusted. Um, you're, I've read about this and, and I actually was, I saw a speaker, um, a government official from Taiwan. They have a very aggressive system of trying to vet fake news and fake information. Um, it's led by the government. I think there's also some, some news organizations that do it. Um, and so I, I, I think what they do is really great. I will give you a really lame, <laughs> answer <laughs> but like and and but i and i i think this is new to people but um you know one difference is if you're seeing something that's sort of crazy this is more for consumers and and i won't bore you with reporting but um or i can if you want me to but <laughs> if you're seeing some crazy thing on social media about you know some outrageous thing about uh you know Susan Collins and Sarah Gideon or, or whoever, and you're not seeing it printed in local newspapers or hearing it on like local radio stations. Um, again, I'm sorry if this is obvious to everybody. When I publish a story in the newspaper, I, I work at the New Yorker magazine now, I worked at the New York Times in the past, there are very you know complex, uh, some people say too loose, but there are libel laws. Um, if I defame you, Sarah mm -hmm. or Bernie, uh, you know, and, and, and you can sue me. And, and every newspaper has a lawyer. Every piece that appears on the New Yorker website or in the magazine is read by a lawyer um, and, or a legal team to make sure we're not doing that, to make sure we're not printing just completely false information. There are no liability, um, you know, uh, no, no liability uh, dangers for Facebook, Google, Twitter, no one on the internet whatsoever. You know, they have no responsibility uh, financially for what's posted on their platforms. You know, they argued that was needed to sort of create the internet, but I think things have changed. Um, so 
again, nobody trusts the mainstream media and those kind of outlets, but, but I, I think part of the solution could be having some kind of uh, liability threat for slander sort of ex extended onto the web. Um, so if you're a conservative, I have good friends who work at the Wall Street Journal. You know, it's, it's owned by Rupert Murdoch, the same guy that owns Fox News. Mm. You know, if you're seeing something crazy online and it's not in the news pages of the Wall Street Journal, it is likely false. You know, and if you're liberal and you're seeing some crazy, you know, kind of liberal conspiracy and it's not on the news pages of the New York Times, it's probably false. Journalists love to compete. They love to break stories. Everybody wants to go win Pulitzer Prizes. So it's not that... You know, we're not publishing in the New Yorker or something, you know, this huge story. We're not publishing it because we can't prove it and we don't want to get sued. Do you think that, um, do you think that the paywalls for, for example, the Portland Press Herald, does that not help that cause? It helps. It helps them because they can pay journalists to do straight, accurate stories that the, that they, if they're, if you have a business model where you're not relying on traffic, on clicks, where you, you've got a steady base of subscribers, you can then, you don't have to be sensational. You don't have to be partisan. You can just sort of present the facts. Uh, you can, you know, pay people a, a kind of stable wage. And I know that's frustrating because it costs more, but I would, I mean, I can <laughs> the total bias here as a journalist, but like, you know, you don't have to do it everywhere, but paying a subscription for information, you get what you pay for, helps journalism. I would argue it helps democracy because um, it allows for, you know, there to be investigations um, by news organizations. And uh, Colin Woodard, uh, who writes for the Press Herald and has done a bunch of investigations and almost won a Pulitzer Prize a few years ago, um, you know, is a friend of mine. So I, I think that um you know keep we got we got to keep the subscription costs low but paying for your journalism is a great way to get better quality journalism yeah so you're saying i can't just go on twitter and get all my news from there and then you can triangulate on twitter and <laughs> no no but you can look at different sources and and you know a lot of twitter is links though to to, to news is, yes. stories that's, you know, that's from, very fair from mainstream news organizations it's just that um you know, there's, there's, it's, it's, um, we can't, the fact checkers can't keep up with the amount of information that's being posted online. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into this whole era of deep fakes, you know, where every, where videos and audio and, and photos are manipulated. Um, but we're not, we're not quite there yet. Um, yeah. that's that be good though. It we're is getting close really to that good. with yeah. AI. Then all mm -hmm. of this could be faked. Everything we've said could be redone. That's I mean, the big show. It's not the, just our show. Yeah, we'll but put I, Trump's face on you. <laughs> I, I more people will watch for sure. I gotta, yeah, for sure. Hmm. yeah. Now that was a good point you brought up about the legal responsibility you had that you could mm -hmm. be sued for slander and Facebook yeah. and those places can't. So that really makes what you do much more credible, which is good. I mean, people are and pe really people don't know that, but that's that's. Yeah. And I I we fear it. I mean, I I we you know, there's been places that have been put out of business by libel lawsuits. So it's. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's been a, it's a system that's been around for a long time and I think it should be expanded to certain parts of mm. the web. I think you should be able to post anything you want on the web. I, and I'm, this is, there's some people in Congress I've talked to who mentioned this, but they're, they're trying to look at, is there a way to, you know, does something um, post whatever you want on the web, but if it's amplified by a platform, should there be some kind of liability for amplification of false information? Mm. And it, this is really hard stuff. Uh, there's no answer. I don't want the government deciding, you know, what is true or false, uh, what is libelous or not. That that should be a jury. I mean, you know, libel trials are just right. like any trial. And, and, you know, so it's a, it's a very complicated problem. But I, I just think it's a, it is one of the biggest challenges mm. of our time. But again, Sarah is going to figure it out. And, and oh, yeah. Yeah. Sarah's the youngster. Young she can people. figure all this out. <laughs> Plenty of time for us. But, um, yeah. So another interesting thing I was going to ask you, what do you think the effect might be of all those recent books that have come out, like Rage and Mary Trump's book and Bolton's book and the, the book named Fake President? I mean, I love the name of that book. I didn't read it. But all these books, you would think they should have a big influence to, to help 
Ozzie. We are, but we are so divided um, politically mm -hmm. that I, I don't, you don't see much change in the polls. I mean, you, you, you know, I don't know, 40% of the country supports the president, 40% or more opposes him. Um, and so I, I don't, you know, think that they're making a big um, difference. I mean, and I think it's, um, I'm trying to, how do I phrase this? Um, it's important that we keep talking to each other. Um, I think when we dismiss the other side as sort of, you know, foolish for believing Trump, or liberals are all socialists, um, you know, that's not, you know, and, and again, a strange thing about online, like I think people say things online, they would never, they wouldn't feel comfortable saying to people face to face. Mm. Uh, you know, they, they say very nasty things. And I think that's again, trying to better understand the, the, the web and this online world and how it impacts the way we get information and the way we, uh, we communicate. Um, so I, I don't know what's going to happen in November. Um, I want everybody to vote, you know, and have the right to vote. I don't care who they vote for, but I, I, um, yeah. it, it's a very, you know, it's a very difficult time in the country, just in terms of the pandemic and the division. I think it's, mm. it's, it's sad to me how divided we are. Yeah, that's true. I hope the person gets picked at least by the popular vote this time and not the electoral college. Again. <laughs> well, we that's the, you know, that's the, yeah, you <laughs> it's a big issue. We'll see what happens. Yeah, it's kind of a shame that we're that divided because I like talking to the other side too. Um, you know, to get Bernie's up. always talking to oh, all sorts the other of side, people. yeah. <laughs> but what do you, see, I can do, I want to turn this around a little bit. I mean, do people question, you know, your findings as a scientist or, or um, see you as a like elite snob who thinks, you know, you know everything? Yeah, does anybody um, go like astrology is real? Oh, yeah, I even have students. I mean, they even <laughs> courses astrology and not astronomy. So, I mean, that they my don't. wife thinks it's real. So, you know, is it real? <laughs> no, it's not real. It's a pseudoscience, David. <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> it's just, it's vague enough that it feels real. Mm -hmm. We simple narratives appeal to us, mm -hmm. whether the narrative is, you know, Joe Biden's evil or, or, you know, Donald Trump is evil. And that's a, you know, I think it's, it's, it's unfortunate that that's how polarized. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, in a lot of ways, that's like, it's, there's this attraction to essentializing things or finding kind of the pure essence of something. And that happens in science too, where, you know, you try to whittle everything down to the smallest thing that makes up whatever it is you're looking at. And you want to say everything is, is that, you know, life depends on oxygen. But, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's true, like it, we need it, but it's not the, you know, without everything else, it doesn't work. Yeah. You've been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG with myself, Bernie and David. Stay tuned for songs from Power Out with DJ Cole and from your favorite nerds, Mask Up, MU Issue Healthy Bodies and Clean Air.